Hello, greetings and welcome to the Stockholm Security Conference, organized by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. Thank you very, very much for joining us for our very first session. My name is Diego Lopez. I'm a senior researcher with the Military Expenditure and Arms Production Program here at CIPRI, and I'll be the moderator of this session titled Global Military Spending and the War in Ukraine. But before I introduce the excellent panel we have lined up today, let me start with a brief rationale behind the session. Soon after Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, several countries announced increases in their military budgets. Germany, for example, approved a 100 billion euro investment package to boost defense capabilities, marking a substantial shift in its security policy. According to a recent estimate, 29 European countries have pledged to increase their military spending in the, in the coming years, adding up to $209 billion. While most of these announcements have not been inked yet, it is very likely that Russia's war against Ukraine will further accelerate the ongoing upper trend in global military spending. The current security landscape casts an ominous shadow over recent efforts to revive the discussions on constraining global military spending. In 2020, the report of the UN Secretary General on Women, Peace and Security set out the ambitious goal to reverse the upper trend trajectory in global military spending as a means to buttress human security. The following year, the same report elaborated at length on this goal, underscoring how even amid a pandemic, military spending continued to grow. These documents, published before Russia's aggression in Ukraine, mark a return of military spending to the discussions about disarmament. Since the late 1980s, the issue of military spending reductions, as well as its economic and social consequences, waned as the Cold War came to an end. Furthermore, the WPS reports, they also draw a link between disarmament and development that has been long neglected. The Securing Our Common Future agenda observes that the development agenda has overlooked the issue of disarmament in recent decades, even though their linkages are enshrined in the UN Charter. However, despite the challenges that the war in Ukraine brings forth, its effects on the disarmament agenda are not foreordained. Just as the conflict can severely hamper any efforts to curb the rise in global, global military spending, it may also catalyze disarmament efforts. And that is the topic of today's session. We'll discuss in the following hour what is the impact of the war in Ukraine on global military spending and what are the consequences of the war on disarmament efforts pertaining to military spending. Luckily, we have an excellent panel today that will guide us through these very difficult questions. So let us start the discussion with some hard facts. And let me turn to, Lucy, to Dr. Lucy Biro-Soudreau for that. She's a senior researcher and director of the Military Expenditure and Arms Production Program at CIPRI. And her research interests focus on European and Asian arms trade, military spending, and arms industry. Lucy previously was a research fellow for defense economics and procurement at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and an analyst at the French Ministry of Armed Forces. Lucy, one of the main products that CIPRI offers is the military expenditure database. And we've been collecting data on military spending since the late 1960s. And every year we release new data for over 170 countries. So based on this wealth of information that we have, can you give us an outline of the main trends in global military spending and what are the forces driving global military spending? Thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, hello, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for these for these questions. So yeah, I'll try to give a, so a brief overview of the main trends in military expenditure in recent years and hopefully to set the scene for, for the discussion. Um, so CIPRI estimated last year that in 2021, world military expenditure surpassed the 2 trillion US dollar mark for the first time, reaching 2.1 trillion US dollars. And as a share of GDP, world military spending reached 2.2% in 2021. And yes, sir, there'll be lots of numbers in my presentation. <laughs> so, um, so this uh, represented a 0.7% increase in global military expenditure in 2021. And it was actually the seventh uh, consecutive annual increase in spending since 2015. And this, this growth followed actually a period of decline. So I think that's also interesting to, to keep in mind for a discussion. There has been periods of re reductions in military spending. And that was particularly true after the crisis of 2008, uh, after which uh, military spending decreased for a few years. The trend resumed upward after 2014. Um, and annual military expenditure since then rose consistently, averaging 2.0% uh, per year, um, or a total increase of 15% between 2014 and 2021. But of course, these, these global figures hide regional variations. 
And general trends in world military spending are driven by the world's largest spenders. So this would be the US and China. Um, and together, they allocated 1.1 trillion US dollars to military activities in 2021. So of course, the change in military spending by either the US or China has an effect on the global trend. So if we look a bit deeper at the different regions, I'd like to highlight the fact that actually over the past decades, there has been growth in all sub-regions except for Sub-Saharan Africa and North America. So Sub-Saharan Sub Africa decreased by 14% uh, since 2012, and North America by 5.1%. And the, the reason behind this, so when you look at North America, it's usually many of the cuts in, in US overseas contingency operations um, spending following the drawdown of troops uh, from Iraq starting in 2008. And when you look at US military spending, actually, it's still $100 billion lower than its peak um, in 2010. So today we estimate, so Cypriot estimates this, the US spending to be about 768 billion US dollars. And the peak was 2010 at 876. So we're still like 100 billion like lower than it was 10 years ago, or a bit more than 10 years ago. Um, and now if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the downward trend was since 2014, and it can be explained by cuts um, in Angola, South Africa, Sudan, and South Sudan, and mostly due to economic factors. Um, so for instance, in South Africa, you have the decade of stagnant economic growth um, that led to a fall in military budgets. So those are for the reason where it has been a decline over the past decade or so. Um, one region where, which, with one of the highest growth rates was Asia. And you have plus 48% in military expenditure since 2012. Uh, and that increase was, ma was mainly due uh, to the rise of, of Chinese and Indian military spending, which together account for about 60% of the spending in the region. Um, I won't touch so much about Europe because I'm sure that uh, Yanuel will have more to say about Europe um, in, in his remarks. Um, but of course, like Diego, you already highlighted in your introduction that uh, there have been announcements uh, following the, the start of the war um, for rising expenditure. Um, and so you also asked me about the drivers, uh, and I guess with what I've just said, you can already see what I'm, I'm going to hint at, what are the main drivers behind uh, military spending. So in, in really broad brush strokes, um, if you put aside you know, internal, internal considerations, considerations such as you know, corruption or maybe military rule, in general, military spending is at the crossroads between two key factors. The first one is uh, threat perceptions, uh, and the other one is economic capacity. So you can take those three factors and modulate them uh, either towards like up or down. So if you take for instance, a high level of threat perceptions that would generally drive military spending upward, it justifies increases in military spending to better train, equip armed forces of a country. But a low level of threat perceptions makes it more difficult to rationalize these increases. And it can even justify decreases. So if you look in Europe after the end of the Cold War, many countries decreased their military spending because they didn't see such a high threat. So that's threat perceptions on the one hand. And on the other is economic factors, who obviously play a role. Um, so as I said, after 2008 and the financial crash, many governments reduced military spending uh, after austerity measures. But if you look at other regions, that's true as well. So in 2014, there was a, a slump, uh, like a crash in oil prices. And for those countries in the Middle East for which we can get an estimate, we could also see reduction in military spending because there were less you know, all export revenue. And on the other hand, countries with increased economic resources will likely allocate more to their military, even if there is no high threat perceptions. Just in general, they have more to spend. So that's the trajectory, for instance, in Southeast Asia, who are like countries which have been on a very high economic growth rates for, for a long time. And generally, they were just like getting wealthier, so they had more money to allocate to their armed forces. Um, so I think this brings the question today, uh, at least for Europe, what is going to happen when you have very high threat perceptions? So, you know, the Russian threats at the moment, but also likely an economic recession coming our way, or at least a significant slowdown. Um, so the IMF forecasts slow economic growth in Europe combined with high inflation, and, and governments will need to help their citizens and firms weather the rising energy prices to tackle the cost of living crisis. So I think it will be interesting to watch the, how those two factors play out at least in the European case, uh, very high threat perceptions, but potentially uh, reduced economic capacity. Um, so that's it for my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. I think you brought some really, really interesting points. I guess I, I really like the, how you put, you know, about the, the main drivers of nuclear spending, because as we discuss, of course, disarmament initiatives and so on, we need to understand where the, the what are the driving forces and to address them if we're talking about 
curbing the rise in military spending. And uh, I think the numbers you brought are quite alarming, I would say. We have the seventh consecutive year of increase, the highest level in military spending since uh, the end of the Cold War. So these things are quite alarming, considering also the other, let's say, threats that we have to deal with and the other crises that we have to deal with, such as climate change, that also need a lot of resources. So I guess this says a lot about uh, how we're addressing uh, uh, and our, also our conception of, of, of security at the moment. And I do know that the numbers you've just cited have also been cited at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, and for this, and to understand how these numbers have impacted the discussions, I would like to turn now to Her Excellency Ambassador Maritza Chan Balber, Maritza Balber de Chan, sorry. She's a Costa Rican career diplomat, academic and activist, and the first Costa Rican woman to be appointed ambassador per and permanent representative to the UN since Costa Rica signed the UN Charter in 1945. Maritza Chan was Costa Rica's lead negotiator on the Arms Trade Treaty and is currently vice chair of the open-ended working group on conventional ammunition that aims to establish a new global framework for the lifetime management of ammunition. Ambassador, thank you very much for being here. And the United Nations General Assembly, and of course, the first committee have just met in New York. Can you tell us what are your impressions of the impact the war had on the discussions about disarmament and military spending? Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good morning from New York. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine not only violated the principles of the UN Charter, but also trigger a humanitarian fuel, food, and a financial crisis that will drive millions of people into food insecurity and poverty. The invasion has also put our collective security system in check and provoke a renewed division and polarization between geopolitical and economic blocks between East and West, North and South. All of this happened at the very moment that we needed to build more bridges and fewer walls. Um, when we could, not, when we could no, not lose sight of what was happening in Yemen and Mali, Myanmar and Syria, Libya and Haiti, in Tigray and the Sahel, between Israel and Palestine and in Central America. So what is happening at the first committee? Um, we have seen an increasing inflammatory rhetoric around the situation in Ukraine and massive arms transfers are a matter of public record. Um, it did not ignite any conversation about disarmament. Um, the only calls for disarmament come from the non-nuclear weapon states, signatories of the TPNW. Basically what we, the international community is doing is addressing arms control and non-perforation. And in non-perforation, we have failed for two consecutive review cycles to ad uh, adopt an outcome document uh, for the MPT. However, the discussions that we're seeing at the UN are related to military spending and development. So um, most delegations agree that these resources should be reallocated towards development because otherwise achieving the SDGs will be remain elusive. Guinea, for example, lamented the misdirection of public resources to military spending, which means providing uh, meaningful education for all as an unfulfilling dream. Several other states stressed the ways in which military, military spending have exacerbated geopolitical tensions and competition, and how military spending have put the world on the brick of a conflict unprecedented since the Cold War. San Marino, for instance, condemned the continued increase in military spending while many people continue to be without food and powerfully affirmed that the funds must be relocated towards finding sustainable solutions for the conflicts that affect all life on the planet. And, not, and last but not least, Costa Rica uh, qualifies excessive military spending as a patriarchal mindset that is frequently expressed in a need for dominance and in masculine posturing. Um, in the fifth week of the fifth committee, there were two resolutions on the matter of um, on this issue were adopted without a vote. 
Uh, these resolutions were L5, relationship with this, between disarmament and development, and L63, objective information on military spending, including transparency and military expenditures. Those resolutions were adopted without a vote, but there was EOV for some of the major spending spenders. So this is what I can tell you from what is happening at the first committee. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, in a way, it's uh, a bit also, of course, um, um, not alarming, I would say, but concerning that this, this the, the 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 war did not increase, did not ignite in discussions about about disarmament, but at the same time, um, we can also think that it's a good thing that the link between military spending and development has been, you know, increasingly being being discussed. So, which is uh, in a way good news, I would say, from coming from from the discussions. Um, so, going back to to the numbers that Lucy uh, uh, presented to us, she provided an overview uh, of the numbers up until 2021. Now, I would like to turn the discussion more to 2022 and perhaps a little bit uh, uh, into the future. And for that, I would like to turn to Dr. Jan Joel Andersson. He's a senior analyst at the EU Institute for Security Studies, where he has the analysis of European defense, including common security and defense policy, capability development, um, defense industry, and technology innovation issues. He was a member of the Chief Executive's Policy Office at the European Defense Agency, advising the Chief Executive on strategy and policy, and specifically on the EU defense initiatives such as CARD, PASCO, and EDF. Um, Jan, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has fundamentally changed the European security landscape. Uh, NATO Secretary General Jens uh, Stoltenberg said that the invasion marks a grave moment for the security of Europe. And his remarks, of course, echoes uh, the widespread sense that security conditions are eroding. Can you tell us what is your assessment of the consequences of the invasion of Ukraine on European defense policies and expenditure decisions? Should we expect what should we expect for the years to come, and how does that compare to the period uh, of post annexation of Crimea in 2014? Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you and uh, also to uh, to join this discussion. Um, it's uh, actually my first uh, speaking engagements under my new hat here at uh, ISS, so I'm very uh, pleased that it is with Cypri. Um, I must say that uh, following on, on Lucy's presentation, uh, also on numbers, I, I think that uh, one can make sort of three points, maybe. And, and the first one is that, yes, spending on defense and armaments is up, right? Especially in Europe, right? Because of the war, but it comes from very low levels, right? I mean, we had a decline uh, from 2008 down to 2014 in drastic numbers. Uh, so yes, they have been increasing since 14, but they come up from very low levels. Now, the, the second point I, I think one can make is that the post-Cold War period in Europe, was an extraordinary successful disarmament period, right? Uh, starting already in the late 1980s with declining defense uh, defense budgets, uh, but then accelerating, of course, after the Cold War, uh, millions of rounds of ammunition, thousands of tanks and artillery pieces, and hundreds of aircraft were scrapped. Uh, retired early, uh, 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 brought to the scrapyards, uh, uh, in some cases sold to other parts of the world, but Europe disarmed, Western Europe disarmed, uh, to the extent that now when the war uh, broke out, uh, to, to, uh, to the surprise of many in the Western Europe, uh, 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 the stores were empty. And this is now seriously a problem, because the aid going to Ukraine is coming from very empty stores because of this arguably successful disarmament period over the past 30 years. As late as, as uh, you know, last year, uh, countries in Western Europe were, were cutting up uh, Cold War artillery pieces or, or uh, disposing of, of ammunition uh, stores uh, at the time when, of course, uh, the other side was heavily preparing for war. Now, the third point then is that, what's the future? So the future here now is that Europe is committed to rearm uh, in a rather big time. But again, 
much of this is first to sort of stock up on what has been now uh, depleted and cover the gaps from these you know, decades of past underinvestment in defense. But I think it's also tied to the sort of changing nature of warfare and the surprise over the amount of kit, ammunition, uh, uh, vehicles uh, uh, simply being used in this conflict in Ukraine, this massive war from, uh, from previous thinking of short, rather expeditionary uh, and limited conflicts. We're having massive stores of you know millions of shells, thousands of tanks, having uh, no longer uh, or no longer being there. So for the coming future here, uh, the member states, certainly of the European Union, but also of uh, of other countries, will focus much more on building uh, 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 um, capacity and uh, investment for not only production but also for storage of large amounts of equipment. And the lessons then for the rest of the world uh, is of course being drawn, uh, but uh, a looming crisis in, in, uh, in Asia uh, and elsewhere is of course also uh, 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 high on many people's minds. So yes, arm spend, armament spending and defense spending is up, but comes from low levels. We have had a very successful in Europe disarmament period and three, we are all now focused on uh, rearming in, in a big time for the coming many years. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, Diego, and uh, happy, of course, to expand on any of these uh, points. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. I think you bring a very important point to, to our discussion, which is about the circumstances, right? Of course, we all understand the, the benefits of disarmament and how that can turn into, of course, funding for development. But I guess one thing that we need to keep in mind is, of course, uh, uh, the threat perceptions of the country and sometimes how even low levels of military spending need to be addressed. Of course, we need to, it's always uh, a difficult point to find, which is between the excessive military spending and also military spending that doesn't guarantee uh, uh, deterrence uh, in a way. So I guess your point is very much uh, uh, welcomed. And I think that moving forward, perhaps uh, disarmament initiatives, they need to find the space of action between the benefits of disarmament, but also the room for maneuver that the circumstances they, they pose. And looking ahead and thinking about that space of, of action, now I turn, uh, last but not least, uh, 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 we're happy to have here with us Mr. Adadeji Ebo. He's currently the director and deputy to the high representative of the, of the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs, UNODA. He was previously chief of the conventional arms branch of UNODA, and he was the pioneer chief of the security sector reform uh, unit in the Office of Rule of Law and Security Institutions. Adadeji has also served as the director of political affairs in the UN Office for the West Africa and Sahel, and director of political affairs of UN Operation in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Mr. Ebo, uh, as I alluded to in my, my opening remarks, military spending is having kind of a return to the forefront of disarmament discussions. It features not, not only the WPS reports, but also in the Securing Our Common Future agenda, which points to excessive military spending as a hindrance to economic growth. Uh, but much has changed in the brief period between 2020, when the WPS report set the goal to reverse the upward trend in global military spending, and now. So I was wondering, how has the war in Ukraine affected the UN efforts to curb military spending? Thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego, for the kind introduction and uh, greetings from New Jersey to the other panelists. Um, and I would like to echo some of the things that have already been said. I'm also, of course, grateful to CIPRI for our partnership uh, and for what you are doing uh, to make a safer world. Let me say a few things quickly. Uh, you've, you've heard the other panelists about, you know, the, the trend in global military expenditure being on the increase. One thing I think needs to be clear. 
this trend did not start with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, it started much earlier. Some will say 2017. So the effect of the Russian invasion is, you can call it a propelling effect uh, on what was already an existing trend. In terms of um, the summerment efforts, let me, let me simply just echo what the ambassador said. Uh, in terms of the worry we are beginning to have um, on what would appear to be almost the inevitability of war. Um, and this, the logic of deterrence seeming to take over, you know, um, as the only way to prevent escalation and expansion of war. I think this inevitability of war is, the, is, the, is what is translating into the numbers that we are seeing in terms of increasing military expenditure. Uh, the reason why I say this is that we will need at some point to find a counter narrative to this inevitability of conflict, uh, what I would call a culture of peace that needs to be constructed. Otherwise, we are on a speedy downward slope uh, of military chest beating. Uh, it, it's almost as if you need weapons to, you know, to be strong. Thirdly, I would argue that perhaps we are even fighting the wrong war. You know, um, of course, states have, just to be clear, states have legitimate security concerns, including the, the defense of their territorial integrity, their political independence. Uh, but this can only include military concerns. It's not limited to military concerns. We heard the Secretary General uh, earlier, I think it was this week, uh, at the climate change conference, saying that we are on the way to climate hell. Now, if security is such that we have other issues beyond military challenges, we've heard about gender inequality, uh, we can also talk about the North-South divide, education, health, these are all sources of insecurity. I think uh, if I remember, Cipri actually published uh, something on the human security dimension to, to Milex. I think we have, to, we have to recognize that there is a lot more security than military. Um, so the point to be made here is that as the Secretary General said, if we are indeed on the way to climate hell, then increasing military expenditure cannot take us to a security paradise. There is a lot missing in between. Um, and my message is that perhaps we are fighting the wrong wars. Uh, we are identifying the wrong enemies. Um, the real enemies are education, lack of education, lack of food, um, certainly the climate, um, inequalities between states, uh, and these are the things that we seem to be, I think, marginalizing why we are all focused on the military dimensions. So a lot more is needed than, than military. My third message is on, and I think this has been stressed by other speakers, but just to put some, some illustration on it. For the UN, you know, Article 26 is what, is what, um, is perhaps the oldest illustration of the importance of military expenditure. So balancing military spending is perhaps the most concrete disarmament objective written to the UN Charter. Um, and Article 26 talks about promoting the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security with the least diversion for armaments. This means finding a governance model by which governments can guarantee the security of states without compromising the socioeconomic development and well-being of its people. 
For example, a reduction of 17% in global military spending would cover the annual cost of achieving Sustainable Development Goal 4.1, which talks about the universal access to primary and secondary school ed education. One Hellfire missile costs 117,000 US dollars. That would be enough to pull more than 700 people out of extreme poverty. So these are the kind of trade-offs we are talking about. And as rightly identified, the issue of military spending is featured in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, as well as the UN Secretary General's Agenda for Disarmament 2018. Also, our advisory board on disarmament matters has also been requested to reformulate recommendations in this regard. And this request, I must say, predates the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I think reflects the Secretary General's concern regarding growing levels of military spending and their impact on SDGs. Now, the latest thinking um, on, on MILEX is contained in what we call our common agenda uh, published last year of the Secretary General. And that agenda recommends a new agenda for peace uh, and which would serve to update our vision for disarmament and that new vision for disarmament would guarantee human, national, and collective security. We believe that the new agenda for peace could involve a set of commitments to reduce excessive military budgets and ensure adequate social spending, as well as tailor development assistance to address the root causes of conflict and uphold human rights, and also link disarmament to development opportunities. Now, to be clear, uh, we have 193 masters in the UN. It is not up to us to determine what spending levels are appropriate or proportional. So the issue of low or high, that's for member states to determine. Uh, and I should also stress what has been said, that this will differ across regions and time spans. So here we need to be conscious of you know, the regional dynamics and trends, and that we can talk about a lot more. Uh, while, for example, in Europe, um, there's a lot of concern about Ukraine in the immediate sense. Uh, in other parts of the world, um, they are worried about counterterrorism um, and how that is leading to military expenditure increases in some countries. And as has been said, the global trend is not, uh, increase in global trend of military expenditure is not uh, increasing everywhere. In some places, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it is decreasing. But even within Sub-Saharan Africa, for some countries, it is increasing because of their uh, war against terrorism. Let me also quickly uh, talk about the importance of normative frameworks. Since the UN is not able to dictate to member states, I think the best thing we can do is to emphasize the importance of those normative principles of good, transparent budget, military budgeting processes, the importance of oversight uh, to ensure that in the determination of military expenditure, uh, societies at large, including civil society, uh, legislatures are able to make that determination and that this is done as transparently as possible. I think for now, I will stop there. Perhaps the only thing I would add is the, just to mention for now, perhaps we can come to, to it later, uh, the UN instruments for transparency that we have, particularly UN, uh, military expenditure instrument, and also the UN Register of Conventional Arms, um, which are instruments to promote transparency. But that we can detail out a little bit later, so I don't stay too long. Back to you, Diego, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ebo. I think you raised some, some very, very interesting points. 
such as the idea and the need for a counter narrative to the idea of the inevitability of war. And while we were talking, I was also thinking about the inevitability of the effects of the war on the disarmament agenda. Um, right now, as uh, uh, Ambassador Maritza Chan, she has said that so far, uh, the war did not ignite any discussions about disarmament, but at the same time, uh, it comes to mind the example in the 1970s that building on the political momentum of the end of the Vietnam War, Soviet Union proposed a cut in the, the military of 10 to 15 percent in the military spending of the, the members of the, the Security Council. Um, and of course, you know, during the Cold War, uh, the, the proposal went to the General Assembly, but it, it was it was not uh, um, uh, it, it did not move forward. But just to point out that the war can also have this effect of propelling initiatives about about disarmament as well. And the, the inevitability of the of those consequences, which is, I guess, is the point that we are discussing today, this open ended question of what are the effects? They're not inevitable. Uh, uh, as well, um, Jan, do you, I, I see you have your your hand uh, up? Do you, would you like to to come in and, and uh, um, I don't know, say something? Uh, yes, if if I could uh, just uh, follow up a little bit, since I had a rather short introduction, and maybe also clarify a, a point. Uh, I mean, uh, in the case of, of, of Europe, uh, you know, Europe is at war at this point. Uh, so, so before disarmament discussion can start, first, uh, this war needs to be won. Uh, and uh, the biggest uh, driver of either if climate, uh, climate change uh, threats or, or development threats is war. Uh, and an unprovoked uh, attack by one of the UN Security Council members on Ukraine. Uh, ignited this thing. Uh, so yes, uh, it's a driver of armament spending, but it also, uh, I think, a lesson learned for many countries that not spending enough on armaments and defense is really at their own peril. The horrific destruction of, of Ukraine truly has, has made uh, minds uh, uh, focus in, in large parts of Europe. And uh, uh, not having enough artillery or artillery shells or, or missiles or, or soldiers uh, at this point uh, has uh, really uh, uh, changed the discussion and understanding also what makes peace possible. So before we can sort of really go into a serious discussion on disarmament, uh, in not only in Europe, but I think also other parts of the world that are directly and indirectly affected by this uh, major conflict and war, in Ukraine, uh, we need to win this war and uh, uh, before that can go on. And that will take some time. Uh, and it also will take uh, many years, uh, I believe, on quite heavily investment in uh, uh, both uh, uh, arms production and uh, the way of how to think about conflict and peace. Uh, uh, and this is ongoing now, not only in the, in the EU and Europe, but also other parts of the world. Uh, so unfortunately, um, this will uh, go on for quite some time. But at the moment, uh, uh, being able to to win this conflict first, I think, will be the best way of addressing these other solutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jan, for for your remarks. I guess this is precisely what makes this uh, this session really interesting. Is really the dialogue between those uh, those different positions, which I'm, I'm very pleased that we are that we are having, um, we can start now the the moder the, the second part of the session, which is the moderated panel discussion. But I see that Lucy, we can start with. Uh, I saw I saw that Lucy had her end, hand up as well, so maybe we can start with her uh, remarks and then initiate a discussion. Lucy. Yeah, no, it's just I want to also react to what was just said, and I guess following up on both um, Adedeji and, and Yanuel's <laughs> remarks. I think one of the key points that was raised, I think, by Adedeji is also the the question of oversight, because in a way, I think it's difficult to tell like if there's a high threat perception in a given country, and as Yanuel just reminded us, and as if I mean, we don't need a reminder of that that uh, there's war in Europe <laughs> right now, like the whole country is being destroyed, and it's like tragic events occurring like on the by, by the minute, um, it's hard to tell to another country, like you shouldn't feel threatened or, you know, it's hard to tell another 
government what their threat perception should be. So obviously, I think it's for each country to define that level of threat perception. But then the question is, is really that of oversight, because if each country decides or can consider how threatened they feel and how much they should allocate to the military, then you need quite some, you need the oversight. So for each country, then you need civil society's parliament to be able to control how this threat perception is defined, how you know, a government thinks that they should allocate such you know, expenses to procurements, what type of weapons um, are required, what type of you know investments you need in the military. So I would say to me, that's, that's really the, one of the key answers, not necessarily defining a, a level of excessive military expenditure, but it's for each country to determine this. But then again, with like societies in control. Thank you very much, Lucy. I, I also agree with your point uh, because leaders, we, we may discuss disarmament, you know, on the international level, but at the same time, leaders are accountable uh, to their own institutions. So I guess that's one good way to think about how, you know, military spending can be at least regulated uh, in, in, the, in that sense. Um, uh, I want to, as a follow-up uh, to the discussions, I would like to now turn to Ambassador Maritza um, once again. And um, Ambassador, the, the goal to curb rising military spending is an important part of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. As a matter of fact, reducing excessive military spending has historically been a key objective of the Women's Movement for Peace 1995, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for, for Action um, already included provisions to reduce excessive military spending for the sake of social expenditure. Could you elaborate a bit on the linkages between military spending and gender and the importance of this relationship for, for disarmament? Thank you very much for the question. Um, this precedes uh, the Beijing Declar um, Platform for Action. It actually comes with the UN Charter with Article 26 that we heard earlier today. But curbing military spending uh, became an important component of the WPS agenda only until 2020, 2021, and 2022. Uh, before that, there were no references to the correlation between military spending and gender inequality or gender sexual, gender-based violence or other issues related to women. In fact, disarmament is not mentioned at all in the body of resolutions of the WPS agenda. The only reference to disarmament is within the context of disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration DDR. And this is something very important that we must keep in mind. The crux of the matter is that we will never achieve a transformation, a transformative potential of women's empowerment without the inclusion of disarmament within the WPS agenda. Um, applying a journalist perspective to weapons, and that's what Costa Rica has been doing for the last two years in the in in every fora, uh, from um, small arms like weapons, the MPT, uh, cyber, um, all these matters. Um, means understanding the different ways that men, women, boys and girls, and people of different uh, genders engage in and are affected by and respond to armed violence. We have done so because uh, it is key to developing effective solutions and break the link between violence and masculinity. It is often said that women are vulnerable, and that's not true. Um, it is the availability of weapons that makes women and girls vulnerable to gender-based violence and sexual violence. And conflict further exacerbates this situation of vulnerability. Having said that, one of the problems of the WPS agenda is that it focuses too much on women bodies, but not on women minds. And that factor of empowerment, it's key to achieve sustainable peace and inclusive solutions. Um, one of the issues that we also have put on the table is that violence is a gender phenomenon. And that is not inevitable, inevitable that we can, um, it's actually the product of gender social norms that can be triggered and exacerbated by weapons. It can be prevented through good policies, robust implementation, and appropriate funding. 
But what we have learned from the WPS reports is actually that funding for women organization has decreased um, to $150 million in 2020 to 100, compared to $181 million in 2019. Um, we also know that the, the, the number of women taking part in um, disarmament negotiation, leading delegations, taking the floor is less and less, um, even though for this, in this uh, first committee, 50% of the statements delivered by, um, by delegates were women. So that's good news. Um, another point is that we cannot continue to see, uh, to, to, to relate women without talking about these gender norms that affect all weapons. And, and without having that gender perspective, we cannot have an inclusive conversation that breach the silos in which we are stuck at the UN. Whenever we have a discussion about women's participation, um, what we hear from the delegates is that women issues belong to the third committee, that those are controversial issues. And if you mention gender or gender diversity of all genders, you will find um, a lot of opposition for delegation because they consider that a controversial issue. And let's keep in mind that the WPS agenda is binary. So there are a lot of things that are missing in the WPS agenda is actually the floor, not the ceiling. And, uh, and what we have found is that it is possible, and through the work of Ray Akinson, to look into military spending through feminist lenses. And this is one in very interesting contribution, whereas uh, she says that we cannot achieve peace and security with the resources that we're obtaining for selling weapons and, and using uh, the Terrans instead of cooperation um, or negotiation. This feminist approach to military spending is actually the way forward for disarmament, for arms control and, and non-perforation. We should pay attention more to, to the feminist approach that places human security at the center of our um, security concerns and that foster a more inclusive um, international system um, in which we all have a seat at the table and, and women's voices are reflected not only in the final text of our efforts, but also in our delegations that must have priority in order to, to, to fulfill, you know, a basic standard uh, when it comes to peace and security negotiations. Thank you very, very much, Ambassador. Um, so uh, as, I, as I understand, the, the WPS agenda from 2020, still, as you said, the floor, so a lot of work to do uh, in the future, but uh, we're hopeful to, to hear you uh, um, uh, you know, we get our hopes high when you, when we hear you talk. So thank you very much for that. And also, I guess your your intervention also can inform the work that Cipri does in that matter. That we're still uh, thinking about this. So thank you very very much for that. Um, I saw that Adedeji had his hand up in a moment. So let me perhaps uh, address a question to Adedeji now, and perhaps if you want to expand on what you had in mind before, but. Uh, uh, Mr. Ebo, throughout the Cold War, one of the main points of disagreement about reducing global military spending was whether one should focus on setting targets for a progressive reduction of military spending or on creating instruments to objectively, objectively measure military spending. Uh, since then, we have witnessed great progress in transparency measures, the creation of the UN standardized instrument for uh, reporting military spending expenditures was a significant achievement in that regard, something that uh, a work that is complemented by also what CIPRI does. So my question is, does the UN standardized instrument for reporting military expenditures still play the same role it did back in the 1980s when it was created or has it changed its purpose over time? Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Um, well, the purpose has not changed. Um, what has changed? 
at the dynamics around the, the Milex. Let me, let me provide a bit of background on the UN Milex instrument. It was inaugurated in the 1980s, as you've, right, as you've rightly said, uh, was born out of a discussion surrounding the reduction of excessive military spending. Now, when this debate failed to bear fruit, as you have uh, earlier articulated, member states then shifted their focus to transparency measures as a first and more realistic step. The instrument was created in the spirit of Article 26 of the UN Charter and is a continuation of that rationale. And that's why I said the purpose has not changed. Now, the instrument allows member states to submit voluntary reports on their annual MILEX in four broad categories, personnel, operations and maintenance, procurement and construction, and R&D, research and development. Since its establishment in 1981, a total of 121 member states have reported to the instrument at one point or the other. Unfortunately, recent years have witnessed declining participation rates. During the most recent cycle, only about 22% of member states have submitted reports. We attribute that to a number of factors, including reporting fatigue, a lack of capacity, and concerns over national security, which led to undue secrecy. Uh, to oversimplify, one could say that perhaps increasing military expenditure is accompanied by a decrease in reporting. That said, Transparency in military matters is as important today as it was when the Milex, uh, UN Milex instrument was inaugurated. So we are working hard to reverse the decreasing trend in participation. At ODA, we are reinforcing our team and we plan to organize capacity building workshops for member states. We have also funded the project with CIPRI uh, under the UN Trust facility for cooperation in arms regulation to create example submissions for each UN member state. So taken together, we hope that these steps will enable more member states to report on military spending. What I was going to say earlier was uh, on two things. One on um, the WPS agenda. Uh, and I, I want to echo what the ambassador said on the issue of diversity uh, and the importance of feminist approaches. Listen, for me, it's, it's, it's quite, it's, it's simple, but also <laughs> um, crucial, the importance of, of, of the women, peace and security agenda. Without that, it's a bit like trying to walk on one leg. You know, it, it's, it's just not possible for the human race to have security without the security of women. And, and I don't know how, how else one can trumpet that call that human security is not possible without the security of women. It's, it's as simple and it's as important as that. The second comment I was gonna make has to do with, uh, back to the question of Ukraine and, and um, the comments by Mr. Anderson on the UN chartered violation, which I think is indisputable. Uh, and that is worth emphasizing. I, I think the violation of the UN charter does not do any of us any favor. Um, and I think the member states have been clear on that. Secondly, and on, on that same point, is the issue of um, how the war is in quote, won. Um, I think there are many ways of winning the war. I hope that the use of missiles and weapons would not be seen as inevitable and that we try as much as possible to make space for the political solutions to, uh, to this conflict. And I think the solution would ultimately uh, belong to political negotiations 
um, and not the inevitability uh, of fighting through it. So I just wanted to add that space and that element of negotiations uh, in terms of the outcome of the conflict in Ukraine. Back to you, Diego. Thank you very much, Mr. Ebo. Thank you very, very much. Very important points. So with that, I guess, let me turn back to, to Jan then. And I think one of the, the, the points that Jan is, is bringing is that the war is still going on. And the point, perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, Jan, is that should we be talking about disarmament only after the war has ended, regardless of the means of ending the war? Um, so that's a that's an interesting point. But something else that is also going on at the moment that we're not talking about that much anymore is, of course, the economic effects of the pandemic, right? And one thing that I'd like to ask you, Jan, is considering that the world is still grappling with economic effects of the pandemic, how do you think the countries, and mostly, I guess, uh, uh, European countries, will finance this substantial increases that they have announced? Should we expect any um, negative economic consequences of it, such as perhaps uh, uh, you know uh, um, affecting somehow macroeconomic stability or economic growth? Or do you think the countries, they have uh, mechanisms in place that will allow them to increase this military spending without any of the negative economic effects and without perhaps competing with other important issues such as uh, 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 international aid or their commitments with other uh, uh, other areas. So back to you, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Diego. And, and I think this has been a rich uh, discussion. I've been mean, very happy to be part of it. So, but uh, yes, to follow up here, I mean, in, in the first couple of days of, of the war in Ukraine, right? I mean, there were there were uh, Russian uh, armored columns racing uh, down to, to reach Kiev. And basically, in a, in a swift attempt to to depose the government, uh, impose a new government, and and then sort of be done with it, right? I mean, the war could have ended there, right? I mean, and supposedly that was the plan. Uh, but thanks, uh, not only to to and primarily to the bravery of the Ukrainian army, but also uh, not uh, to be uh, discounted were these thousands and thousands of of anti-tank missiles, anti-tank rockets uh, uh, being flown in, in, in uh, this massive uh, last-ditch attempt to, to strengthen uh, the Ukrainian army before, before this inevitable thing happened. And, and coming from British, from Swedish, from German, from, from other countries, you know, military stores that were still available, right? These armored, you know, columns were stopped. Kiev is still uh, the capital of, of a free Ukraine, and, and the war continues. But it could have ended very swiftly, which would have been then an end to the war, but not on the terms that either the UN Charter would, would have agreed with or, or the, in fact, of the Ukrainians themselves or most of, of Europe. So, so the war continues, right? And, and the question then is, is that how, how much can we sort of take, I mean, you know, the economic effects? Uh, Armament and defense spending is up, uh, but again, as I said in the beginning, it's from rather low levels. Uh, it will continue. It will continue to increase for some time. Uh, but even if you look at the numbers, right, compared to the size of the economy, still even at two or three percent, you are far, far below the levels of during the Cold War. And and I think this is sort of then comes to to the choice, you know, what society does. Uh, public policy, uh, weighing different sectors. Uh, uh, so, so we're still uh, below the Cold War spendings of, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten percent of GDP that some countries were 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 spending on defense during during those uh, coldest years. Um, I, I think the war has truly horrified Europe. I mean, the sheer amount of destruction, the way the the Russian army has behaved. Uh, the the sort of the threat to to this whole sort of understanding of, of European security has been shaken. And this will be with us for, for quite some time. Uh, so the willingness to to spend on defense, uh, I think is is there for for uh, uh, quite some time. Um, and, and I think also this stretches beyond uh, Europe. Uh, uh, the discussion on on uh, the conflict situations in in East Asia, uh, the other parts of the world, uh, and we are unfortunately, I think, in a period 
of the conflict uh, in a way that uh, we for many years uh, thought we had sort of passed over in large parts of the world. I, I remember spending uh, some time 10 years ago, uh, a few weeks at the uh, University for Peace in Costa Rica, which was a wonderful uh, uh, event. And, and how we then discussed uh, international relations uh, with the students there, and, and also then how they seem to be in a very different uh, era. Uh, but now uh, uh, with this uh, uh, horrific war uh, continuing, uh, I think we need first uh, to uh, uh, win this war, as I use that term, uh, because uh, yes, settling the war is uh, not enough for either Ukraine, I think, or for Europe. Thank you. thank you very much, Jan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to now, as uh, I think Jan, he opened a bit uh, the, or widened the, the, the scope of discussion by the end of his uh, uh, intervention. And for that, I want to bring in Lucy uh, once again. And Lucy, we've talked about Europe's military spending, but we, of course, mm -hmm. need to consider the real uh, big spenders as well, like the United States, mm -hmm. China, India, UK, and Russia. Uh, together, those five countries, they account for 62% of the world's total military spending, which is, of course, substantial and just shows the, the sheer concentration that we have in those top mm -hmm. five. And uh, apart from those, apart from the obvious cases, of course, of the US, UK, and Russia, should we expect the war in Ukraine to affect Chinese and Indian military spending as well? Uh, and if not, could you please elaborate a bit on the driving forces of military spending in those two countries? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Diego. I'll, I'll try to be brief because I see that time is running. And in a way, Jan, you also like, addressed this point uh, briefly that, of course, in other parts of the world, like the war in Ukraine will not directly affect military spending. But as I mentioned before, like one of the key drivers is threat perceptions. So in other regions, like mostly in, in Asia at the moment, you do have also this rise of tensions. Um, and uh, so that you have, you know, several like, so like security dilemmas. Um, China's threats against Taiwan, uh, the South Korea, North Korea uh, uh, dynamic uh, countries in the region who are also worried about China's military modernization. So you have like countries like Japan, Australia, who justify also their increases in military expenditure by the rise of China. Uh, also, not forgetting you know the India-Pakistan uh, conflict. So, uh, so also in in Asia, those um, the military spending is going up uh, for those sort of like threat perception and intentions uh, reasons. But I'd like to take the opportunity just to, if you don't mind, just starting to answer one of the questions that came up uh, in the chat, because I think it also follows up on what uh, the previous discussion was about. So one of the questions is um, actually from one of our colleagues, uh, Peter Vesemann, who asks whether, you know, given this like, relatively poor performance of the Russian military in Ukraine, does it justify increases in military spending in Europe? Uh, and the way he phrases it like, uh, this, it's a questionable direct military threat, and European NATO spending is much higher than that of Russia. But I think in a way, we can't think of this just as the short term. I think as, as Jan, you all already put like, the mindset has shifted in Europe. Um, because if you imagine, like even if, if Ukraine was to win the war in whatever terms uh, in the short term, what tells us that in 10 years time, like Russia wouldn't build up again its, its, uh, you know, its armed forces? So I think it's it's really, as Jan said, it's, it's a really long-term trend, at least in the European setting, because you don't want to leave that window open for Russia to, to become a threat, again, against NATO, against our Eastern European you know, neighbors. Um, and I think at, at this moment, like on the back of you know, re Ukraine's resistance, Europe is buying itself a strategic window. Um, so, so I really don't see this as a... And we shouldn't see that like, Russia's relatively poor military performance, and, and I'm not the expert to say that, but um, as a, so like a reason for not increasing military spending, for decreasing military spending. Um, again, I think it's really for, for each country's, uh, you know, decision makers to find that balance. Um, and we need to also think that, you know, within NATO, uh, NATO's new strategic concept uh, requires European armies to increase their uh, the level of their high readiness troops from 40,000 to 300,000. So that will require investments as well. Um, so again, I think unfortunately the, the even though I get at the Digi's point that we need to build a more culture of peace, uh, the times we, we are at the moment, I think are quite uh, pessimistic. 
Uh, thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, since we begin, uh, I guess, addressing, which is already what we're going to do, the, the questions from, from the audience. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask if anyone wants to chip in on, on, on about this, this question that Lucy raised about threat perceptions of uh, in the Russians' performance and the need to increase military spending. If not, I can read uh, another question. You can open your mic and uh, start yeah. if you want. Uh, Jan, yes? Yeah, could, could I ask quickly on, on this sort of Russians? But but yes, I mean, you can say that the Russian has performed, you know, not as 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 well as as perhaps had been expected, but I mean, the sheer destruction wrought and, and the fact that they that they keep on doing it, it makes, makes sort of any, you know, any sort of idea of, of wanting to have this type of conflict on your territory horrific, right? So, so uh, it's it's not a question of of uh, you know uh, relative defeating uh, the Russian, but preventing any this from from happening. Right? Uh, thank you very much. So uh, yes, I'm going to read a question now. I think this one is open, um, not directed to to any of uh, the panelists, but the, the the question is: How could a baseline for disarmament be established? Uh, should it be a percentage cut based on the previous years, five-year average, or based on high spenders? That's something that we kind of talked about, touched uh, uh, upon in our discussions about uh, maybe the, the need to take into account regional differences. But I guess it's a very legitimate question when we're talking about we have the goal on the WPS agenda to curb military spending, but in practical terms, what does that mean? Uh, does anyone want to to take that question? I could try. Yes, please. Thank you. I to answer your question directly and precisely. I don't think you'll ever get to answering the question of baseline because the fundamental basis is one of sovereignty, uh, national sovereignty. And security is the preserve of each state. I think the most practical you can get is to establish the principles through which that determination of military expenditure is made, which is why I spoke earlier about the importance of the norms of transparency uh, and not confusing um, issues very often with there is so much focus on secrecy when what is needed is confidentiality in military budgeting processes. Confidentiality and secrecy are not the same thing. I think when there is uh, confidentiality, there's room for transparency and there's room for societies beyond narrow circles to make the decision on how much a society devotes to military issues, and I'll argue more broadly, security issues. Um, so that is uh, how one I could try to answer that question. Back to you. Uh, Ambassador Maritza Chan, you, you had your hand up. Thank you for the question. Um, for many years now, Costa Rica um, has made a call to reduce military spending. We have never ask the abolition of all armies. I think it's, as um, I will explain, it's a sovereign right or any state. But we, what we have been calling for is a gradual reduction that is not only possible, that it's imperative. And the reason why we're asking for a gradual uh, reduction is because the more weapons we produce, the more will escape are even our best efforts for management and control. These weapons will exacerbate and hamper the resolution of countless intersecting environmental and human rights crises which strengthen sustainability, security, and stability on life on the planet. So if we agree on a gradual, sustained reduction of military spending, we will, you know, step do a right step forward in in achieving um, our uh, goal of, of that was enshrined in the UN Charter, and we do have an opportunity to make this goal 
when we negotiate a new agenda for peace. In the, the new agenda for peace must recognize that excessive military spending has become an issue and it increased before the war in Ukraine steadily for seven years and it will continue to increase year, year by year from now on. That opportunity, it's an opportunity that, can, that cannot be missed and that we must take a, a advantage of. Um, I think that uh, member states may agree on calling for a gradual reduction of military spending without impinging in their sovereign right for defense. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, we're now, uh, unfortunately, coming to an end of our session. Uh, we had so many more uh, questions, but I don't think we'll have the time to address them. So just to uh, finalize, I just want to thank you all very, very much for the excellent session that we just had. I think it was a very fruitful discussion. Uh, we had a lot of common ground, but also had differences, and, the, and we all discussed them very uh, um, respectfully. So that was very, very good. I'm just, um, I just want to thank you all for accepting the invitation. This session really uh uh to be to be honest it, it started really uh, uh as an attempt for us even at cipri to try to understand how we can do our our, our job after the war and uh, this was very informative of course not only to cipri but for everybody that knows interested in in the topic so thank you very much we have a lot to think so uh yes i guess that's it and i just want to say uh that for uh, I want to want to say to to everybody to to our audience that the next session uh, that will start at two forty five uh, from the from the the Stockholm Security Conference it's called what weapons are significant for current and future warfare lessons learned from recent conflicts so that starts two forty five uh, please do join I'm sure it's going to be a really interesting uh, discussion as well. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I would like to finalize then and thank you very much for you all.